welcome to the Dripping Stone Podcast, the podcast where two friends raise a glass and have a conversation. I'm Nick. I'm Kyle. Kyle. Hey, man. How's it going? It's going pretty good. Yeah. What, what you thinking about? <laughs> <laughs> you sound like my wife. <laughs> really? Man, that's always like a loaded question. <laughs> what are you thinking about? I don't, never mind. I want, let's walk that uh, back. <laughs> whiskey. Cheese. <laughs> thinking about cheese. <laughs> Thinking about toenails, they're just weird. <laughs> they keep why growing. Do we have them. I keep clipping them. They keep yeah. growing. Why, why do they keep growing? This episode's off the rails, and we have only started. Mm. How's it going? <laughs> it's good, man. Yeah. Yeah. How, how was your holiday? Um, I don't know. I haven't had it yet. I mean, in terms of recording, we haven't had it, but right. Could, I, don't, I mean, I don't want to say it was good oh. because, like, man, it might go off the rails, and like everybody that was there knows it did, and then like they listen to this episode. And oh, like, I He's see. full of shit. <laughs> It's actually the worst. It's actually the worst time of yeah, my life. That was actually awful. Like there was nothing good about that. Okay, the knowing, whole thing. No, listen, listen though. Knowing you, knowing your family, knowing your wife, it's not going to go off the rails. It's going to go really well. It's going to everything's going to be smooth. Disagree. I think it'll go off the rails because it always does. <laughs> but somehow we, you know, We're, okay, tie it all together sure. and, and get through it. Let me ask you this: Does anybody else know it goes off the rails, or is oh, it just yeah, you? No. Oh, okay, bro. There was a year where like. We had the turkey in the oven for like four hours with I remember, the oven I was not at, on. I was at this year. So, yeah. That was like at the, people know. That was at the old house. <laughs> yeah. And we we're all like. People are aware. Uh, what are they doing? Do, do we just why, order why they, a pizza? Yeah, why are they like, still in the. Like, I don't understand. Yeah. That was. And I, I remember that year very distinctly. Same. That might have been our first, like. That might have been our first year going to Thanksgiving with you guys. Yeah. Uh, and then I remember at one point the whole house filling with smoke. Mm. I think that was that same year. My, who knows? <laughs> yeah. And here you are asking. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Okay. Your stuff always goes so well. So what? everybody everybody knows. What are you talking about? <laughs> everybody knows we record ahead of time. So I was just, yep. you know, I was thinking like in terms of recording ahead of time, but uh, in hindsight, mm. I'm going to say everything went well. That's what I'm trying to say. I got you. Yeah. Uh, it went I mean, well. I like your positivity. Thank you. It's my, um, it's my optimism, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, but. I, I I try to be a realist in that sense, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fool you guys, because y'all know, y'all know we we record this stuff early, yeah, so true. there's no need to be like, hey, how was your holiday? They haven't had it yet. <laughs> <laughs> you ruined my intro, Kyle. Like I planned, I even wrote it out. Did you? No. That's in the script. No. How was your holiday? Kyle replies, it was amazing. <laughs> It was so grateful. I wrote it in orange pen, which means it's legit. We all enjoyed our sharing of thanks. Is we've done that? Mm-mm. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was no. like, I don't think we've ever done that. If we did, I, no. I checked out very clearly. No, that, that, that that's where I'm going to start going oh. when you ask how it was something that we haven't had yet. Okay. I'm going to go into a lot of like really fine details. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to do that whole thing again? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, now that uh, you've ruined the intro, Kyle. Sorry. That's okay. It's fine. <laughs> I need a drink. All right. Okay. What Got do you want one. to drink? Uh, I have a bottle that we, we've never had anything from this distillery, but it's a rather popular one. Oh. Just our first time dipping into Old Arbelor. Ab- Arbelor? Arbelor. You know, it's Scottish, so it's got to be pronounced. Yeah, who knows? Give me, give me your Sean Connery. Arbor-lore. Nah, that's not it. Aberlore. Nope. Aberlore. That's probably close enough. Aberlore. It's, it's probably going to be... How did I say it the first time? I don't know. Okay. Okay. Aberlore. Sure. But this is uh, this is not just their regular Aberlore. <laughs> this is Abonad. <laughs> <laughs> we should take a class in Gaelic or something. Yeah, we really should. You know? uh, because instead of, instead of just butchering it you all know, the time. I, I think that Duolingo has Gaelic. Oh, do they? Yeah, I think so. We no probably, yeah, we should probably do that. Yeah, because, be I mean, we, we drink enough uh, uh, Bonahaven and, I mean, now the Avalor to probably need it. St- what, what, st- stay the, right there. <laughs> the, 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 the stay right there. <laughs> stay right there. <laughs> and the tote. To, 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 toe touch. Yeah. Anyway, so what you're saying is we're drinking scotch. We are drinking scotch. Um, what makes this a really fun bottle? One, it's it's cask strength. Uh, we're coming in hot at a uh, 61.2%. So 122.4. Oh. 61.2. 122.4. Yeah. 122.4. Yeah. That was quick math. Um, well, it's it's on the bottle. Oh, okay. I, I don't really have to do anything. But it is also matured in Spanish Oloroso sherry butts. Ooh. <laughs> This is a. It was a bottle that I've I've kind of had my eye on. Yeah, been wanting to try it. Heard heard a lot of really good things. Haven't had a whole lot of sherry influenced things. You've probably had more than you know. Well, I guess I mean like heavily. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and what, like this has the 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 like they reputation right, that right, it's right. heavily sherry. Yeah. And, and what why I say that though is because like in 
getting more into scotch as as we've already talked about a lot here lately. Right. A lot of scotches will use it's the holidays, man. Yeah, well, it's it what we do exactly. A lot of scotches will use in their blends um, some sherry rested uh, distillates. Yep. So even if they don't like market it that way, a lot of them will use some sort of like version of, of rested sherry stuff. Like I think McAllen does this all the time. Um, Dalmore does it like, you know, the big names also. Sure. And they just assume that, you know, that that's the case. Right. But what's interesting is that they're marketing. Like we are doing this. Yeah. Heavily, heavily. C- can we talk about a bottle real quick? Yeah. That is a unique bottle. It is a very unique bottle. A little, had, little squatty. Yeah. I've had nothing by Abelor at all. Okay. Like I've never had it. So I've actually, I've never seen the bottle. Like I've always seen, they, they come in the, uh, as most scotches here in America do, they come in the, the sleeve. Yeah. Yep. I've never opened one for whatever reason, but that is a interesting bottle. Yeah. Yeah. Quite the um, girthy top. <laughs> the neck on that thing is thick. Yeah. That, yeah. that is a big cork too. Yep. Like, yeah, not as big as a. Uh, did you open it? Uh, I did. The yeah. cork, the cork is like not at, like not huge. Oh, I feel like the old granddad. Yeah, that I think might be that's a, little, a big cork, a little bit wider cork. Cork's almost kind of normal. I, size. I guess I'm saying like the top. But yeah, the top itself, like the yeah, the wood or whatever that <laughs> dipped in waxes. Mm, yep. Yeah. <laughs> that wood tip. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Thank you. But yeah, no. Open this uh, not that long ago. Yeah. Did, did a fresh crack. Ooh. Um. On Patreon, I did. Yeah, yeah it's on there. Have, have the patrons all already seen it? Probably I'd have to look. <laughs> it's it's been a hot minute, dude. Oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, been wanting to try this one. Got it. Pulled the trigger on it. Um, is it a difficult bottle to find? I don't really know how difficult it is. Okay. I, I haven't seen it too many, but like that, it's also one that like I became aware of it honestly, and it really became like a, a fascination of wanting to try within the past three months or so. Oh, okay. So it's not a bottle that I've been really not in your aware purview. of yeah gotcha, over gotcha. the years yeah just been like recently i'll so, say this i've seen the abelor brand a bunch of times sure that one's not hard to no like just regular and but i also haven't looked past like what what else do you have do i need to know anything about this sure um, and it's like whatever's on your mind at the moment right you know exactly like you're always looking for something else exactly abelor is not you know standing out in my head right now so I, I look past it sure right so, so I don't know how many times I might have seen it a lot and just didn't know, you know. What region is this from? It's a space side. Oh, do you know what a space side scotch means? Uh, it means it's from space side. That is correct. Well, it's from the region of the river Spey. There you go. And it's beside it. Hence, space side. side. Of Spey. Yeah, exactly. Space side. <laughs> where's that? Where's that run? In Scotland. It's not quite as far north as like Highland. Um, but it's on the eastern, mid eastern part of Scotland. <laughs> Are you looking at my Scottish geography, if I know it? Uh, no, I mean, I'm just curious myself. Oh, I need you to test me, though. How, how, how do you want me to test you? Is it in the Middle Eastern part of Scotland? <laughs> it's uh, in, sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Because <laughs> a couple uh, episodes ago, I, I mentioned, I think I said something about an Ardbeg being an Orcadian Scotch, and it's not. It's Isla. No, I think it was the Highland. Oh, was it the other way around? Oh, no, I mean, I think it was the Highland Park. Oh, which is an Orcadian scotch, but I think I call it an Isla or something. I, I, I can't remember. Yeah, Space Side is completely surrounded by the Highlands. Right. It's on like the centrally located, but on the eastern, eastern coast. I don't know. Yeah. UK's weird place. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Let's get into it. Any bottle words? Oh my God, there's a bottle novel in the yeah, back. Yeah, we canister. got a lot of good stuff. All right. You ready? Yeah. Space Side single malt scotch whiskey. Abenad was born in the Speyside village of Arbelor, made with local spring water from the Ben Rhines and Barley, now locally sourced from the fields near our distillery. Beautiful. Let the sherry casks add depth. Yeah. We handpick Spanish sherry casks, filling them with whiskey from the first time, for the first time. Mm. This means their intense flavors infuse Abenad as the years pass. Lovely. Let the old ways live on. Do it. Abenad means the original. In Gaelic, Ooh. because we meet, we make every bottle as we would have done 100 years ago, in batches with no chill filtering. Oh, Abenad is as close as you can get to tasting a dram at original cask strength at our distillery. Cool, just as our founder James Fleming would have done in 1879. Then, as now, the truth is in the tasting. Oh, you know what I did not hear? What's that? I did not hear an age statement. Don't see one. Yeah, which is kind of interesting for scotches, because like. A lot of scotches tend to like to put that age statement. Yep, I don't see it anywhere. All right. Um, Not a bad thing by any means. But yeah, then it gives you like some tasting notes. And stuff. Okay. Now let's let's do our own tasting notes. <laughs> yep. 
Shall we? Absolutely. Lead the way, sir. Ooh. You know what? Yes, this sir. has a lot of color for a scotch. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite dark. So this goes back to my uh, statement a couple episodes ago about PD scotches being way light, even like a PD 16-year-old scotch. I wonder if that's the kind of a defining marker. You have scotches that are heavily peated that tend to be really light in color. And this is obviously it's um, aged on a, an Oloroso sherry cask. So theoretically, that's going to impart way more color. Yeah. I mean, you know, sherry is a fortified wine. Right. So, yeah. I mean, I would expect that to definitely kind of throw some ad- added color into it. You know, it has kind of a red tint to it. It does. I would even say, like, it's not is just... Is that because of the burgundy top, though? I mean, it definitely could be, but, like, you know, it's just influencing me in thinking that it has, you. like, a, a reddish tint to it. I mean, in the glass, I wouldn't I wouldn't go so far as to say red, but, it, I mean, do- it is bourbon dark. Yeah. Like, which is different than the majority of scotches. Right. A little sniffing? A little sniffing. Ooh. What, what did you say this proof was? 122.4? You got it. The reason I ask that is because the nose does not say that at all. Like, you know there's some proof there. Right. But it does not say, like, this is a very high proof for a scotch. Yeah. Well, shit. I mean, 122. For anything. Yeah, that's just high. Wow. But, like, I mean, you, you got a little bit of, like, a twing yeah. going on. Not nearly as much as I would expect for something this high. Of yeah. A proof. I have to take, like, a really deep breath before it ever, like, kind of, like, makes my eye water. But, like, sweet is all hell, man. Yeah. Ooh. But like fruit sweet. Yeah. You know, not like, like caramel or sugar. Yeah, yeah. Just like, just fruit. Like, and a bunch of like mixed fruit. Like, I can't like pick out, but like, I feel like there's like some sort of dark fruit. Yeah, but like mixed. Like, I mean, no, knowing that it's a, a single malt scotch that's been aged in sherry. Yeah. Like, I, I definitely get both of those things. The, I get the scotch. Yes. I get the sherry. Yes. It, they're, they're, it's very noticeable. Yeah. That they're there. That's super interesting. Like you can very easily define like here is a scotch distillate and they're like, oh, here's all the sherry notes that they're putting in there. Right. Wow. That's... You could almost like, like I would almost think it's a blend. Yeah. You know, that's really interesting. And and what I mean by that, like, or what I think we mean by that is you're getting the, the quintessential kind of scotch rounded, warm, malted barley notes um, that impart that like really nice, even keel sweetness. But then there's like a depth of sweet that we were getting from that Oloroso sherry cask. It's like, or, or butts that like, wow, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of fun to me that they're taking just the ends of sherry casks. So like you're, I'm assuming that the cask that they're using is uh, an American oak cask, probably, you know, second fill uh, bourbon cask or something of that nature. But then they're putting the, the sherry ends on the cask. Right. I was get like milk chocolate. Yeah, I'm excited for just, this. Just a touch of raisin. Yeah, right which which I would expect that out of out of something with the uh, the sherry notes there. Yep. All right. Can I say it? Go for it. Enough <laughs> sniffing. Time for sipping. A little spitting. I found the proof, bud. Mm. <laughs> there it is. Mm. Man, where it is lacking the proof on the nose, it is not on the palate. Like you get proof. Whew. But that is nice. Wakes up everything. I get a fruit salad. <laughs> like a like a almost like a what what's that fucking holiday cake? The fruit cake. <laughs> <laughs> like a fruit cake. Like there's there's some of those like that the, the barley comes through mm. in, in bready kind of notes. Yep. But there's just so much of like a fruity almost like a fruit glaze, like glazed fruits. Yes. When when someone says fruit cake, like I automatically go to that like stuff that's just too much. But like a good fruit cake, where you get those like really beautiful dark, um, super well rounded, like brown sugary notes, and then those like spikes of of fruity like influences, like right. that's what I think of, like something that's done well. Yeah, I don't mean it in, as like a <laughs> yeah, no the shit that oh. you buy like at the gas station <laughs> fruit cake. Yeah, yeah, that's good shit. <laughs> What'd you get? God, another fruit cake? No, like this is a fruit cake you want to eat. <laughs> you want to eat? See, you said fruit salad at first. And I, I think that I'm I'm right there. It's fruit salad, like somebody has mixed or chopped up their own fruit and has let it you know kind of meld together. Not like fruit salad you like out of a can. I'm saying like somebody has chopped these strawberries, has like put these bananas in there, and they've you, you let a good fruit salad to me needs to sit a minute so that you, the flavors kind of combine. 
And that's what I'm getting out of this. There, there are some like cherry notes. There are some strawberry notes. There's like, I would even go so far as to say some banana E notes in there as well. And then you get like, it's all held up to me by this beautiful, like dark fruit wine undertone that is like, just rounds everything out. Yeah. Like there, there, there's such a richness to it. Like it's quite thick. Perfect description. Yeah. Rich. But like the mouth feels quite thick. Yep. And so, I mean, it just, it just lingers, but it's, it's bright at the same time. I get a whole lot of barrel too. Like a whole lot of oaky, which I didn't expect because like knowing that this is the sherry butts, you know, like I, I would feel that that would push forward, but I'm getting like just. Yeah. On the finish, it's like, it's prominently. Yeah. Yeah. I would even the, go the to say like, finish. it's, it's more barely than some bourbons I've had. Yeah. And I, I love that. Like that is fantastic. Yeah, super, super different yeah. than like anything that I've ever had. really truly is. If I had to find a negative here, I think it might be a little on that sweet side. I can see that for you. Yeah, like I think the proof does cut that sweet just enough, but to me it is a dessert. Oh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, dessert it's definitely whiskey for sure. in that realm of, you know, it definitely has like the elements of like a cognac, mm-hmm. kind of a mm. the, the sweetness to it. And I think too, the, like, especially the fact that it, it ends on the oak so prominently too. Yep. If it still ended and you still felt like that sweetness kind of clinging, yeah. I think that would be a little too much. But I think the proof and the oak that's stop a good, it. That's a good point. Like right away. Yeah, that's a really good point. Keep it from becoming too much. Yeah, because you get sweet, 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 sweet oak, and then like the proof is just kind of like guiding you along that. That's a, that's a perfect way to describe it. Yeah. But yeah, it's just so different from anything else that I can think of. Oh yeah. That it's so unique. Yeah. No, I love it. Like, I think it's really good. And I think really it is. Different. I, I agree too. I'm, I'm going to go find a bottle. Yeah. Cause, uh, that's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, and, it, and it's that kind of a thing of finding something that's that different that, you know, you think, oh yeah, no, that, that fits perfectly in the lineup of like all the different things you know, I think we were talking about it last week with, with bourbon being so confined that right. it is kind of difficult to find one that sets itself apart. It can definitely happen. You can do it, but it, it just they're all so kind of similar and like working around the same exactly thing exactly. Where this is so different, but still a Scotch single yeah. malt whiskey. Yep. But it is so unique and different. Like it definitely makes me want to like you know go out and find other sherried whiskeys. Yeah. I mean, if you were to give this to me and say, like, you know, this is a quintessential scotch, I would say, like, no, no, you got the no, it's not quintessential scotch. Mm. There's definitely something interesting going on here. Um, But that to me is what makes scotch, like you just said, interesting is that you can do so much with it or not that you can't do so much with bourbon. But like, I guess that scotch has been doing it for so long that like this is kind of what scotch is, is right now is like they, they want to do these these interesting things. They're interesting. They're interested in more exploration that I I would love to see out of bourbon. I think we talked about this last week a little bit, too. Like you're going to start to see that. Yeah. This is what fascinates me about the world of, of scotch whiskey as a whole. Right. And I, and I think, you know, scotch has been around and been beloved for so long. And like with bourbon coming into this newfound joy that everybody's having for it, right? Hopefully that'll inspire, you know, some cool things like that, right? Well, and I think the point being too, like, you can find if you want like the best representation of like just scotch, and I say that like not trying to be you know demeaning in any way, but like you want just scotch, you can absolutely find it. Mm-hmm. You know, you can get your regular Macallans. You can you can get those kinds of of just this is scotch. That baseline. Yeah, exactly. Statement. Your Glen Fittics, your Glen Morangi. Like you can find those things. Right. And that's great. And you can do the same with bourbon. You can get your your Jim Beams. You can get your regular Buffalo Trace. You can find that kind of stuff. Right. But then like. Yeah. So many great examples. Absolutely. Of like just what, what is a great bourbon? Right. Yeah. There's tons of it. Exactly. And then. The Scotch world to me has like just exploded that out, and like you you want the regular thing here it is here's your here's your Brook Lottie the, your classic Lottie yeah. boom Scotch, but if you want some other stuff here's you know Black Art there you go right good luck bud you know that kind of thing <laughs> or you know yeah, you, you, yeah. You, that's what your wallet says <laughs> good luck bud or uh, you, you want your Octomore and and here here it is right you know what I mean so. Uh, got a question. Okay. Now that we have a phenomenal drink, Kyle. Yeah. What do you want to talk about this week? You know what I did last night? What did you do last night? Had to do a thing last night in preparation for this. 
this was a thing that I, I've had several people talk to me about. You need to do this. You need yeah. to watch this. And just finally, just now, got around to doing it. We've mentioned it previously on the podcast. We have. Last night, I watched the last two episodes Ooh. of Ted Lasso. Yeah. Yeah. I am proud of you and happy for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Through, through those two seasons in, probably took me like a month to get it all in. I got it. I actually started it in Chicago. Oh. Uh, watched the first two episodes there yeah and thought i was gonna be able to watch the whole thing up there and then the 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 situation at the airbnb didn't didn't allow that (laughs) so got home got my apple subscription and and got it got it done yeah and it's amazing it's a really good series the comedy is like just right yeah and the fact that it's like you know i mean here in our household, we, we're very much Anglophiles. Sure. We, we enjoy the, the English culture. Yeah. Um, so the fact that it's it's based in London and there's, or not in London, but, you know, around London. Yeah. Um, it, it's so nice in that way of like you pick up some of those just quirky English things. But sure. Clearly in an, an American based production. Right. Oh, man. It's just, it's just so good. Yeah. It, you know what? Like. It, I've loved Sudeikis for a long time. Yes. So to see him actually like take on a project like this is super like it's, satisfying. Yeah, it, it is. It, it's satisfying to see like a guy who I mean got his I think his chops either SNL or Second City. Like I I, I mean they all kind of like in that realm. I know that he was he was on SNL, wasn't he? Yeah, he was on SNL for yeah, a long time. I thought so, but it was never um, like a a highlighted correct. character. He, he was a person that was on snl yeah um but to see like like i can't honestly off the top of my head i can't think of any major skits right that he did he was always like in a scene yeah but it was rarely ever around him like Correct. i remember like his he wasn't a his beatboxing or, dancing dude yeah. on the on that one that one thing where it was like keenan thompson's like this crazy like talk show dude that dances like every few minutes yeah and then <laughs> sudeikis comes out and does this like <laughs> crazy like break dancing in like a jumpsuit yeah track suit it, it's it's been really cool to see like his career and how you you have this guy who like y- you found your niche and like you you had success with it yeah and, and you know sure yeah stars align could be just you know right place right time but like it is it is great in all the right ways. It's just cheesy enough. Right. It, it's got enough morality and lessons. Like the comedy is such that like, you know, you got that fish out of water kind of com- comedic aspect and the people like oh, poor American kind of thing. And he's like, I'm just trying to figure shit out. It, it's so good. Yeah. Uh, do you know the genesis of it? Mm-mm. So it was a commercial associated with, I think it might've been game day or college football in some way. And it basically like introduced this character. And I'm pretty sure it was for ESPN of like, uh, this is Ted Lasso. He was an American college football coach, but now he's coaching soccer. So no, you know what? Now that I think about it, I think it was for um, the premier league. It was a premier league uh, thing. And they're just kind of like making fun of it, making right. light of it. And and it was originally like a, I don't know, like a, just a m- skit. minute and a half skit commercial kind right. of thing. Just as like a, a funny way of like, you know, Hey, there are Americans that like this too, and here you go. Right. And since then, what I I saw an interview with him. I think he was on. Uh, I think he was with Fallon, maybe. But he was talking about like since that, I had this idea of like let's make this a thing. Like, why is this not a thing? Right. It would be a funny fish out of water, stranger comes to town type story, and it works. The lighting in here just changed. That was kind of <laughs> weird. But I think it's the sun. It's not yeah. our lights. So he was like, you know, I think this is going to be an interesting story. Let's do this. And it was kind of shelved for something like five to seven years. Like mm-hmm. it was that original idea to like inception of the show was quite some time. Right. From what I understand, like he personally shopped it around to a lot of different places. And finally, Apple was like, yeah, like, let's do it. Like, this is this sounds cool. Like, let's make it happen. Right. And then it happened. And they did it. And they won like an insane amount of Emmys for it the first season. And then the second season won another insane amount of Emmys. Right. What's interesting to me is a lot of times when you get a show that does that well on a critical level, it doesn't normally do that well on a fan level. Like there seems to be some sort of disconnect. Some, I mean, you you see this with like the films, a lot of films that win a bunch of awards tend not to be like super fan favorite films. 
you just kind of know like this is Oscar baby type of film. Right. Here you have something that like fans love, people love, and has just won a shit ton of awards. I mean, I feel like I feel like for whatever reason, the Emmys are a little different. In, yeah. in, in that way. I feel like television's a little bit different. Like, I mean, you know, if I think if I think back, like Friends used to win sure, stuff. Sure, sure. Like Will and Grace used to win a lot of stuff. Like the West Wing used to win a lot of stuff. So you think it's more fan based? I feel I feel like the Emmy specifically when you're when you're talking about like TV awards, like yeah. Maisel wins a bunch of stuff True. all the time. Like I feel like they are for for whatever reason a little bit more in sync okay. with what the fans are saying. Like whereas in cinema specifically it's it it, it looks as it at itself as such a different art okay. form True. that it's a little different in that aspect. Either way, this is but either a way, shit ton of awards. Yeah, yeah, it it and rightly so. Yeah, it's it's fantastic. Like it's so well done. But I totally agree. Like it it it, it kind of surprises me in a way that it did win so much, just because like it is, it it has like a very kind of almost like nineties like TGIF <laughs> kind of feel to it. It really of, like does. the wholesomeness aspect of it. But then it can get very dark and very, you know, psychologically yeah. challenging in some of the things that they address. And then it can also get very kind of not quite R rated, but like definitely adult themes. Oh, for sure. You know? and, and so it, it, it definitely casts a uh, a really large array of things that it can talk about and, and maybe, deal with. And maybe that's why it does so well is like the net that this is working within, right. like that, that net that it casts, like you mentioned. Right, you know, so wide that like is bringing in so many people. Right, for um, sure. And that, I think that's part and parcel, not only because of the the central character Ted Lasso, but also like you have this cast of misfits that like just works so well. Right. Before we go further, before we start to spoil some things, let's let's take a step back and let's like what is this the basic story of Ted Lasso? I know we've kind of talked a little bit about it, but what is the basic story? Basic story. College coach, college football coach in America from Kansas, yep. is hired on to coach a Premier League soccer team in the UK. So a football coach is hired to coach football. Yes. <laughs> but not the same football. But not the same football. Got it. And it's all in an effort to sabotage yeah. the, the the club Correct. in the UK. Because the, the now owner got the club in a divorce mm-hmm. from her ex-husband. And so, and, and the the club meant so much to him that she's trying to do everything she can to ruin it. So it's right. very much a a a major league type scenario. Correct. Um, another great yeah, sports sports movie where the 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 disgruntled ex wife is trying to <laughs> destroy the club. Right. Actually, I don't know if that was the case in Major League. I know she was trying to move the team to Miami. Yeah, there was there's some was like that was lines along that. I don't yeah. know if, it, if she was like an ex wife, but anyway. Um, so yeah, like first the the first season very much gave me like major league vibes mm-hmm. of you're trying to bring in all of these riffraffs to to try to ruin the club. Right. But that certain set of chemistry that you got together ended up making this great thing. Yeah. Okay. So now I think we can spoil things. Okay. So uh here on out, if you haven't watched Ted Lasso, continue to listen to the episode. Yeah. <laughs> but if you if you haven't watched and Ted then Lasso, go watch Ted Lasso. Right. <laughs> exactly. If you haven't watched it, you need to go watch it because it's great and honestly it's it's one of those things that like everyone yourself included that i've recommended it to afterwards has loved it yeah like i've i haven't heard anyone like oh that that is all right yeah yeah no one has said it sucked no one has said it's all right everyone else has said like no it was really good and some people like that might have been the best thing i've seen on tv in a while well that and it's also it's refreshing that it's only around 30 minutes an episode exactly they're not like the big long ones and it's only 12 episodes a season yep so it's compact. Yep. It's easy watching. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So for me, I watched Ted Lasso over the course of like maybe a week. Mm. And at first, I, I I fell in love with it, honestly, like episode one. Same, yeah. Carol was a little more reticent. It took her about four episodes before she was like, okay, I actually care, which I completely understand. Right. Because, you know, sitcoms, which is what this is at heart, sometimes are a little bit like, okay, how much do I want to get involved? Like, how much do I care about these people? Right. But I think it's a testament to the eponymous character, uh, Ted Lasso, that, like, he gets you to love this character. Jason Sudeikis gets you to love this character. And and that's exactly it. Like you, you mentioned that it, it does get dark. That second season starts to deal with a lot of, of really, like, human 
human things. Yeah. Like his his big struggle in the first season is that he's going through a divorce. And that's part of the reason why he's in the UK, why he right. accepted the position was to give his wife some space. Correct. They were going to work through some stuff and hopefully this would help them kind of reconnect in a in a strange way, you know, giving them space and hopefully like, you know, once it was all said and done, they'd get back together and be great. Right. And you know, we we've mentioned it in in the other episode about optimism of like that's just Ted's constant focus is being optimistic. Everything's going to work out. It's going to be great, you know, and just go at everything positively. And it'll hopefully all work out. Right. And which then, which I want to come back to in terms of like toxic optimism. I want to come back to that eventually. Okay. Okay. That that's that's the crux of season one. Mm-hmm. And season one ends with the team losing enough matches that they get um relegated. Relegated. Yeah, which is in English football, the the tier system I think is like is super cool. I wish we kind of did that here. But the tier system is such that you can as a team go from the Premier League, which is the top of the all of the tiers and drop to a lower league, which means theoretically less money, less people, less, you know, less of everything. Right. But you can also go up too. right. Yeah. Which happens in season two. Correct. So the the team is relegated. And also at the end of season one, doesn't the wife ask for a divorce? Yeah. I don't know if it, if it happens at the very end. No, because it, it's kind of something more that they kind of because she comes to visit. Correct. At one point. Yeah. yeah. And on that visit, she gives him the papers of like right. I need you to sign these and get these back to me. Right. But it is something like throughout the season that he's kind of dealing with and having issues with and he finally and he finally does it. You know, accepts it and But what to me is interesting about that that plot line is that they deal with it in a way that like a individual would deal with it. In that like this is such a present thing. It's such a, a thing that's at the forefront of clearly this character's mind. So it's also a thing that's at the forefront of us as viewers. But it's not really talked about or when it is talked about, it's kind of dealt with in like a uh, kind of way, not like something that like we just have to do. So then Ted makes the decision ultimately like we, I just got to get this done. Right. And I think that is really interesting. And that that's how this whole series deals with things. It's like these issues are issues that we need to take care of the, the forefront of our perspectives, but yet we're not going to talk about it or we're not going to deal with it right away. And yet the character tends to like confront things in the ways that we would hope people would confront them in terms of like the, that optimistic kind of perspective of like, nope, we got to deal with it. You know, you've got a problem. The best way to deal with the problem is to deal with the problem and like, let's confront it. Right. Um, which I think is refreshing because so often you have characters and people like the problem just is there and is never dealt with. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the, the, the greatest like takeaway for me for the, for the story as a whole yeah. is the idea that while you might be great in this aspect, like one self care is is extraordinarily important, but like it's also understanding your own faults mm. and and not pushing them aside and and trying to bottle those up. Right. Um. It it's such an important thing that like you know, you know, Ted is such a great coach and not just a coach of a sport, but just like a coach that he can see what other people need exactly and give them and prod them and point them in a way that is going to help them achieve their goals, yep. which is what a great coach is. It's not necessarily exactly. just like, yeah, I can teach you to hit the ball or hit, you know, do whatever within the game. It's actually like I can give you the perspective to make you a better person yeah. and help you grow. And he says this to another character, to, to Trent Krim, the independent. He right. says this to him. He's like, I'm not really interested in winning. Like, I don't define success by wins and losses. Right. I, I want to give these young men tools to engage in the world, essentially. Like, I, I'm not I'm not interested in whether they all win. I'm interested in, like, whether they win at life. He doesn't say it that way, but that's kind of what he means. Right. Yeah, he, he, he points out very early on that, like, he doesn't know anything about soccer. Right. Like, he's not sure why he's here. But he knows how to coach. Correct. And so he knows he, people. Yeah. So he's going to do what he can to like help, help the individuals, help form a team. Right. And hopefully that will help create success for everybody. And what I love about that first season is that it does not go well. Like there, there are times, yeah, they do, they have some successes, but he's met with such obstacles in terms of like players who he's trying to do this for. And there's so many things of like, pushing push back against that right and like you you as a viewer see the optimism you as a viewer see the potentiality that he's trying to push forward but there's so much 
of a, a kind of a brick wall of like, nope, this is how we do it. This is how it's done. We're not changing this. And yet then you start to see like the things that he's doing actually working. Yeah. Yeah. That, that first season, Ted is obviously the protagonist and he's got a, a, a kind of a, a rogues gallery of antagonists in that first season. <laughs> right. You've got Rebecca, yep. the owner, who is obviously like she's, she's trying to sabotage everything. And then you've got Jamie Tart, right? Who is the you know the 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 all star, but super douchey, yeah, very much the prima donna, sure. of the club. Roy Kent, you've got Roy Kent, who's like the the old legend that is set in his ways and doesn't want to change and doesn't want to address his own kind of age, right? And how the game is changing for him. So you've got you've got a lot of different things that are happening, and you throughout that season you've you got see, all of England looking at him, going like, "What oh, yeah. the hell? Go to, away! To, what are you? Why are you doing here?" But yeah, he's he's trying to confront all of these things, which to me is is also the, part of the success of the second season. Is that in a lot of ways, he's gotten all of these people who didn't believe in him to start to believe in in how he's approaching it, but then he doesn't start to believe in himself. So you have like this one, almost like 180 kind of reversal of his optimism is he's trying to get everybody else to be optimistic. And then he gets everybody else on his side in that going into the second season. Not that everybody, but he starts to get these kind of uh, antagonistic players more on his side. And then you start to see that it's not about that. It's about like the inner turmoil of Ted Lasso. So like the optimism that he's put forth to everybody else is actually a manifestation of his own insecurities. Right. Which I think is fucking brilliant. Yeah. Is that you have this character who seems to a lot of the other characters, and maybe this is the the kind of the situational irony or the dramatic irony of the thing is like we as viewers of the show actually know more than the other characters because we can see Ted's inner thinking in, in some ways. Right. We can see him breaking down. So he's putting up a super optimistic front for everybody else, but he breaks down. And that's where you have the the therapist in the season two. She starts to attack that kind of perspective. And like, Ted, sometimes things suck. And like, you're not dealing with the suck because you want to be so optimistic. But you're actually like undermining that whole thing you're trying to do. At least that's how I see it. I mean, I, I guess to me it was it was his not wanting to admit. Or I guess I mean, it's kind of like, you know, a societal thing, too, of like, mental health Mm -hmm. not being at anybody's forefront right it's always like cover that shit up and like man like there's like when it comes out that he had a panic attack you know at at one of one of the one of the points during season two one of the big games ted leaves right at the most pivotal point of the game because he's having a panic attack and you've, you've seen him have panic attacks throughout that season stuff's just like gotten too much to him and he and he and he freaks out but he 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 blamed it on uh, food, food poisoning. poisoning yeah didn't want to admit what it was um which is like you know it, it's very you know much the case of like something like that you know and there's a really sad moment of once it's finally come out that yeah that's actually what it was he had a panic attack it wasn't food poisoning and this random dude in the street is like everybody's kind of making the point that ah oh, man you know if if my grandpa would have had a panic attack in Normandy, you know, we'd all be speaking German right now. Right. And then another dude's like, you know, go back and have your panic attacks over there. Like, don't, don't, don't come here with that. Right. And it's like, man, like what, what a sad way to address yeah. an issue for a person to be like, ah, you sissy. Yeah. Tighten up. But like, but I, I read something about like the British perspective of that mm-hmm. and like neither of us are British. Keep calm and carry on. Right. I- exactly. No. And it's, it's that kind of like, um, I listened to a podcast where it was a, um, uh, a British guy breaking it down and kind of talking about that. And he was like, you know, there's a, a very, um, British perspective of exactly that. Like it's just keep going. You like in the face of it all, keep going, which is some optimism, but it's also like you're not dealing with anything. But then there's also this like very British way of like there is no pat on the back. There is no like you are doing the good thing or you are doing it well. You keep going. There's no like praise in that way. Right. And I know that I'm being, you know, I'm, I'm distilling things down to a very like minute level, but that's part of it. So like that perspective, I think, is. A, a very kind of British perspective of like, no, 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 take take your feelings somewhere else. Right. Stiff upper lip, 
Right. Shoulders back. Correct. Yeah. Keep going. Just just keep going. So and I think that's really interesting in that the character is confronting that too. Right. Um, which is also an American perspective as well of like. Sure. Like we feelings we don't want to talk about those. Yeah. Like, bottle that up. Yeah. But I, I think. Masculinity. Be ex- tough. Exactly. Yeah. So like that brings me into what I think this show does very well, especially in that second season is healthy masculinity. And where so many things promote toxic masculinity. Right. To me, this, I don't know if it's intentional or not, but is a huge promoter of what I consider to be healthy masculinity in terms of Ted and how Ted deals with things. You have Jamie Tart, who is that douchey guy that you mentioned, toxic masculinity. You have in season one. In season one, right. You have Nate, who is not toxic masculine, but he actually kind of like starts to become that which is interesting in season two. Yeah. Um, you have uh, Roy Kent, who is the epitome of that like old man, like disgruntled, toxic masculinity. And you see all three of those characters, four, including Ted, change in season two, where Jamie becomes more in touch with his feelings after like kind of destroying some of that tos- toxic masculinity within like his father. Right. And that relationship. You see Roy Kent develop the relationship between his um, niece Phoebe and um, his girlfriend Keely. Keely, yeah. Uh, and how he's like engaging with her. Y- you have Ted who's starting to like kind of open up and, and probe like the depths of like why he is this way, why he feels this way. Um, and, and also for other people too. So to me, that second season really becomes a, a, a really cool presentation of what it is to engage in masculinity as a whole. Obviously, this is from a position as a man looking at this and you're not seeing these like super macho dudes become like the popular ones. You're not seeing these super macho guys, the ones who are getting all of the accolades. It's real people confronting who they are and how they deal with the world and in what I consider to be healthy ways. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think for the for the most part, like every character that set themselves up as a antagonist to Ted. Right. He slowly whittles them away and and provides them lessons that allow them to mature. Exactly. You know, for Roy Kent. Yeah. For Roy, you know, it was Ted Ted seeing Nate get bullied. Right. In the clubhouse and knowing that somebody needed to address it and knew that because Roy had come in and said, hey, you need to fix that. He's like, no, I don't. But somebody does. Yep. And and you know, it was like giving him that opportunity broke the shell on Roy. Exactly. For Jamie, it was trying to trying so many different times to get through to him, and it never happened because the opportunity wasn't there. So that when he left and got the opportunity to like, hey, if you're not the star here, right? If you make the extra pass. You'll win the game, and they do, and and which is such a such a poetic way, like lo- loved that, which couldn't have like written it better. Right. Jamie leaves the club and comes back, and is the reason why they lose and get regulated. But then in the next season, Jamie wants to go back to Richmond so much because he knows, man, I learned so much there, and like my my evolution as a human, not just as an athlete, because yeah. he was already the best. He was already like great. Not a whole lot he can improve upon there, but. As in terms of life, yeah. there's so much more I can get there. Exactly. Nate's the interesting one. Oh, that turncoat. Yeah. <laughs> Nate, Nate, Nate is so interesting. Of Because you have a character who is like so diminutive, so bullied, so out of the limelight. And yeah. then he is brought into that because he makes a, a decision that is correct. Like the dude knows a lot about football. Yeah. And Ted recognizes that right, right at the beginning. And gives him a more prominent role within the club. Right. Says, hey, you know a lot. I don't. So let me learn from you yep. what you know. And I'll get you a better position than being the water boy. Right. And so makes him like an assistant coach sure. type thing. And during that episode when Ted does have his panic attack, Nate is right there with a with a plan. The team wins. And he gets a lot of success and notoriety from it. Right. And, and kind of bolsters his, his ego. His ego. And that to me, like that is part of what this show is about. It's about the complexity of character and the complexity of humans as a whole. Yeah. Is that you have Ted who 
understands like this kind of athletic dude it's primarily because that's who he's dealing with right um and he is a good coach and he understands his perspective and he's trying to give someone else a little bit better and then he actually turns them into the thing that he doesn't want in terms of nate i'm not saying like he is the one who turned nate into this like guy who nate eventually goes and works for a a, a rival team the rival team yeah um, the last few seconds of the last episode yeah we, we realized that but like that whole last the whole second season, there's a there's a there's a really large evolution oh, of Nate. Yeah. Yep. I didn't see it coming. Right. Like I saw I saw him changing. Like you, er, you early see, on in the you season. See hints of it. Early on in the season, there's a there's an episode that deals with Nate wanting to take his parents to a dinner for their anniversary. Yeah. And he wants a specific table I want at the, the window restaurant. Seat. And they wouldn't give it to him. And eventually through through the the, the you know events of the episode He's able to kind of like build up his assertiveness, mm-hmm. and he gets the table for his parents, you know, and 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 it works out for him. And and you think he's like again, he's he's taking a step up. He's right. he's he's evolving. He's he's becoming a better version of himself, which is a positive. Yeah, and you and you think that's the the trajectory, until then later on, pretty late in the season, there's an episode where he needs to go get a new suit, and and Keeley takes him, and he's having this great day, this great experience with her. And then he tries to kiss her. Yep. And he's immediately embarrassed by what he did and regrets it. And what was so strange, though, is he went into the dressing room to take the suit off and he spits on himself in the mirror. Yep. And I was like so shocked by that of like, I understand being like disappointed in yourself, but it was his like active like anger and like frustration, I guess, with himself that he was like so disgusted by himself that he he did that, that he spit on himself that I was just like, whoa yeah what is that which which to me goes back to that like the deep-seated um negative characteristics of the individual like you can't and i i think that like for ted lasso as a character he recognizes the good in people but there is some really dark aspects of who we are as individuals that like maybe you can't you can't fix i think that's part of it too of like this almost what i'm gonna say is like semi toxic optimism of the first season of like no it's all gonna be okay everything can be taken care of and yet you get to the end of the second season and you're like oh wait everything's not all good things can go bad things can go wrong and i, I think that that's what is part of the success of the show too is that you're not just dealing with this plucky character who can get things done based on optimism alone you're dealing with so many like rudimentary human emotions that that's what people are drawn to and even in this, like, wow, you, you've you've changed so much for the better as a character, and you still don't like yourself. You're still like your bravado that you've this character you've adopted in terms of Nate. Your bravado has gotten you to a point where like you're still so disgusted with yourself that you would spit on yourself in the mirror. And well, like, and, th- and I that understand was like that. that was like two episodes from like the final, right? And then the, in the final episode, like Ted finally confronts him. Like, so it, it comes out that Nate has leaked the story right. of Ted having the panic, uh, attack. panic attacks. Ted finally addresses him like, man, what's wrong? Like what, what what's going on? Why, why are you so mad? And like, Ted, I mean like Nate unloads on him yeah. and says like, you're a piece of shit. You need to go home. Like all of my decisions got you here. Yeah. You get all the limelight. Yeah. And, and, and it was, it would, it really was like shocking of just yeah. like, I don't, I don't understand where this is going. Like this guy has so positively affected you. And he, and he starts the, the frustration with like you make everybody feel so special and liked and then he words it as like but then at some point in time i wasn't that special to you anymore right and i did my best to like to to get myself back to that position for you which i don't really see that correlation mm-hmm. but right. like it's like i kind of understand it in his perspective i didn't see it in the in the season right and and maybe it maybe it requires like a second viewing. Maybe you would maybe it's like more subtle. Yeah, you see that if you things. go back and you, and you kind of notice Nate being more frustrated. But like I don't know, like he, he he's he's one of the well that what do they call him the diamond dogs? Right. Like, <laughs> I don't I just don't see why like, it's not like he was ever dismissed like that for him to really be that upset. It's the same thing. I feel like that. It's, I feel like it's a reflection of like the same thing Jamie had to go through. Yes. Yeah. Of wanting the glory, wanting to be the boss, wanting to be the exactly. best. It's a perspective of leadership. And I need to leave and exactly. go accomplish that. 
so that when he does, I'm sure season three is going to be some sort of a realization of that. Right. Maybe well, not. Maybe maybe that's just unfortunately Nate's character arc is well, to just be the villain. And I think it's that's a, like a commentary on leadership as a whole in terms of like as a leader, you are only legitimately good as those who you are helping to lead. But that's also like the difference between like a boss and a leader. A leader's like, let's do these things together. A boss is like, you're going to go do these things. And sure. I'm going to get the credit. And I don't think Nate sees the difference there. And I know there's a lot to unpack there that we just don't have time for right now. But like, it's that Ted Lasso is a good coach and a good leader. Right. And yes, the accolades will fall on him. But it's only because he had the forethought and the foresight to say, like, no, this guy knows some shit. Like, yeah, he's cleaning the kits. He's, he's you know, he's the one who's taking care of the field. That's absolutely one thing. But he knows some stuff. That's what a good leader does. And Nate doesn't recognize that. Right. And, and maybe you're right. Maybe in the third season, there's going to be that recognition of, like, sure, but all of this lands on me. Like, I want these decisions or I want to be able to make these decisions, but it all lands on me. Well, and that, that was such, a, like, a great point two of Nate's got that strategy right we're going to use that and it's going to work and then it's not working right they're they're losing and and Ted's like well, let's put it to the guys do we stick with this or do we do we switch and we go back to what we were doing right and they all say no let's stick with it but Nate still puts that on Ted right of like you're sticking with it because it's going to fail and then that's going to reflect on me it's like it's such a, a narcissistic way of viewing everything. Correct. Everything is coming back to me. And if that's, we succeed, it's because of me. If exactly. we fail, you're, it's going to be because of me. And but that to me, like as the as a viewer, that's not the leadership style of Ted. But that's what the individual will see. The individual will see, like in in terms of Nate, right? Because individual. that's what a, a, that's what narcissism is. Absolutely, it's like this this thing is my fault, or or this thing is great because of me. Correct. Exactly. Which brings me to, I think, one of my favorite characters in the entire series or in both series so far, and that's Coach Beard. Yeah, Beard's fantastic. Beard is fantastic. Yeah. Um, even though, like, and he's not without his problems. Obviously, he has woman problems that you see in the entire episode, which is, I think, it's a filler episode, but I think it's good. Um, I think it's fantastic. It's such a cool, like, <laughs> look into this character. Like, and I think any great series does that yeah like they, they they take that that you know side character <laughs> that's just kind of there as like comedy relief right and we build this like epic episode yeah, story sure. uh around it but I, I think like that's what makes coach beard who is the the, the second in command if you yeah. will yeah i would he, even he came with ted correct yeah he came with ted from the uh the, the school in, in arkansas yeah Kansas. um that yeah I, that's what i said yeah yeah, yeah. well i went our Commun yeah. community, community college <laughs> In Kansas. Kansas. Not Arkansas, Kansas. Which is basically the same state. Yeah, they're right there together. Sorry, Arkansas and Kansas. We love you. But, you know, he has this, like, understanding. Like, they're so simpatico. Even though, like, uh, Beard is willing to push Ted. Beard is willing to question Ted. I mean, <laughs> there's this beautiful scene. I think it's, it's either the, towards the end of season one or it's in season two where, like, there, there's a huge loss and Beard's like, no, fuck you, gives him the bird and walks away. And Ted's like, wrong bird or something. I forget what he says. Oh, uh, they're talking about building these things bird by bird, which is a, a kind of an obscure reference to Anne Lamont's father telling her um, brother like to write a book report on birds. And you have to write it bird by bird. That's what that's from. And that's a line that's actually said multiple times, but it's about writing. Right. This is kind of a side tangent, but I just, I love that perspective. And he says something like, they do that in so many ways. Yeah. Like we've got the whole series. There's exactly. so many small little tangents yeah. and like little one liners that are a reference to this thing over here. Right. That they never it, explain. It's gold. Yeah. But yeah, but they never no. linger on it. It's just so, bam, next thing. But that's what he tells him. He's like, he says something like bird by bird coach and beard flicks him off. Sets up the, like the, that night of bird going out uh, or sorry, beard going out and like <laughs> that whole kind of filler episode that's where that starts basically right but it, it also tells me that like coach beard is 
willing to also disagree with Ted and willing to like, no, this, this thing, like it's not working out. He, he's, he's willing to call him out in the right moment Correct. when it's, a, when it's appropriate and, and but because they're usually, they're so in sync right. with each other's thoughts that like they finish each other's sentences. Yeah. They, they, they throw in the punchline to each other's tee up on the joke yeah. that it, it's such a great friendship that they've got, but when it's important and when it needs to be done, yeah. Well, and, and I think that he'll that's, call you out, but that, that is so what the relationship Nate doesn't understand is that beard will check Ted Lasso, but in a very intimate, like, no, like this thing is wrong. He won't at least in terms of what we've seen so far, it's not like he's going to question him in this like big situation where like, no, fuck you, Ted, this is not the way to do it. He will do it in a, in that way of like good friend of like I I recognize you're the you're the face right now and you're gonna make a decision but then I'm going to we're gonna have a conversation afterward it's that and to me that 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 goes back to that healthy masculinity of coach beard realizes the time to have those conversations is not in the heat of the moment it's either before or after those moments and to me that that's what makes that character so successful I mean, I, I agree. I think I think Beard Beard is fantastic in just his their 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 friendship is so they they understand each other so well. Exactly. And like I mean, hell, they've both flown to England together. Who knows how long they've known each other? Um, <laughs> but they're so in sync that they know when to adjust the other. That that's exactly it. You know, you said it better. It's fantastic. I one of my one of my see you in my dreams. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, tell me to do this or whatever it was. Okay. Got you. I got um, you, got you. <laughs> like like the funniest thing was the uh yeah, the wigwam and a teepee. <laughs> yeah. Like God, we laughed about that for so long. It's a wigwam and a teepee in here. <laughs> what? It's two tents. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> like and they like like that you know, that's just so perfect. Yeah, like just that they can like match each other for that. Yeah, and it's like y- y'all's humor is exactly the same. Yeah, in the like, best y'all, way y'all just like y'all are already like <laughs> like the the wavelengths are so in sync that it's like ridiculous. So that when when the other one's wavelength is just a little bit off, you recognize it, and that I need to. There's a little tweak that needs to happen there, and I got you to get, to get you back in rhythm. <laughs> exactly. One one of my favorite side characters is. Um, Higgins. Higgins. Higgins so good. Higg- Higgins is like just like the 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 moral core of the whole thing. Right. Of like, you know, he the the first season, he's always there kind of like prodding Rebecca like, "Hey, you're really missing something special that's happening." And he's doing his best to help her see it. Right. And you know, eventually she does. The one that really got me for Higgins was the Christmas episode. Oh yeah, was, where he invites all the guys over. He has the whole team, the whole the, all the players who don't have a family to spend it with. He brought in, invites them over to his to his family, and it's just such a beautiful like. It really is. Th- that whole episode was just so so nice and so well done, but heartwarming. Yeah. Um, he, he's such a he's such a great like he's he's funny as hell, but he's just he's just like that that warm center that just like whenever you need that hug, man. Just, yeah. Like, you go in there and like ah Higgins. I love you, man. So you mentioned kind of like one-liners. Can I, can I bring up some one-liners for you? Mm-hmm. This is actually a an article from People Magazine, Kyle. Wow. Did you ever think people. we... I know. Did you ever think that we would mention people? Well, I mean, aside from like, you know, <laughs> who was it? Uh, oh, yeah. Chris Evans. Sexiest man alive? Yeah. That's my best buddy. <laughs> Waited on him last Thanksgiving. Ooh. Yeah. You did. Yeah. He, well, he's a listener of the show. Yeah. I, he would be. Like, I, I gave him the Drip and Stone sticker that day. <laughs> Listen to this, Chris. He's on the check. There you go, sir. I'll sit there. And if you scan the barcode there, it'll take you to a great podcast. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so I want to throw out, there are 21 of these. I'm going to just pick a couple. Okay. Because because I, I freaking like the the one-liners in Ted Lasso are so great. Yeah. All right, here's, here's one. Taking on a challenge is a lot like riding a horse, isn't it? If you're comfortable while you're doing it, you're probably doing it wrong. Right. Yeah. Good so one. good. Yeah. And that, that's exactly it. All right, I'm giving give you another one. <laughs> I always thought tea was going to taste a lot like hot brown water. And you know what? I was right. I was right. <laughs> if that's a joke, I love it. If not, can't wait to unpack that with you later. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the happiest animal is on earth? It's a goldfish. A goldfish yeah. Yeah. You know why? It's got a 10-second memory. Sam, be a goldfish. Be a goldfish. Yeah. 
if the internet has taught us anything, it's that sometimes it's easier to speak our minds anonymously. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we fell out of the lucky tree and hit every branch on the way down and ended up in a pool of, of cash and Sour Patch Kids. <laughs> <laughs> if you care about someone and you got a little love in your heart, there ain't nothing you can't get through together. Cheesy. <laughs> Ice cream. Out of context, that one sucks. Yeah, that one sucks. <laughs> Ice cream is the best. It's kind of like seeing Billy Joel perform live. Never disappoints. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Yeah, uh, we we laughed out loud at that one. This one's good. If God would have wanted games to end in a tie, she wouldn't have invented numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I love that on so many levels. Man. Like, oh, God. I got two more for you. Okay. Okay. Our goal is to go out like Willie Nelson on a high. <laughs> <laughs> Last one. This woman is strong, confident, and powerful. Boss, I tell you, I'd hate to see you and Michelle Obama arm wrestle, but I wouldn't be able to take my eyes off it neither. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Uh, it's so good. Like, and, and that, that to me is like, what is the comedic element of the show is that you have these good one liners that are also meaningful in context but also like funny out of context but they present some version of wisdom within how he's exploring these things i think that's great that's what like that that's what draws people to that character is these like small aphorisms these kind of like little witticisms one-liners that you're like interesting oh yeah that's funny yeah i i can't tell you how much time i've spent thinking about and and i had actually seen this as a clip on youtube unfortunately yeah. Before I watched it in the context of the show. But at the end of season one, yep. there's a scene in the pub between Ted and uh, Rebecca's ex-husband, mm -hmm. who formerly owned the club. Right. Uh, they have a, a darts contest, and Ted sets him up Yo. beautifully. Yeah. and Like Pool Shark sets him up. Yeah. And you can, you can you know, go go see the scene because it's it's gorgeous on YouTube or wherever. But Ted has this point of explaining to him, it'd be fantastic if the world would be more. And it was a, it was a quote from Walt Whitman, yep, I believe. I think so. About people should be less judgmental and more curious. Mm -hmm. And I've spent so much time thinking about that. Yeah. And like he does such a great job of like uh, giving it context within the show of, yeah, no, be more curious. Don't be so judgmental. Don't look at me and be so judgmental yeah. of me and my situation. Be more curious. Because the the guy is basically like, like I'm going to destroy you in darts. Like, I'm going to, like, you are not going to be a good yeah, dart player. Yeah, he's trying to set Ted up right. just like Ted is setting him up. Correct. Because he's got his own private little darts. He pulls out his own personal yeah. darts to use. And he's like, oh, son of a gun, forgot I had these. Yeah. And then Ted's also like, oh, shit, I forgot. I'm left handed. <laughs> this is going to be fun. <laughs> exactly. Um, the point is, the, the guy, Rupert, I think his name is. Yeah. He never asked Ted, have you played darts before? Right. And that, that's the basis of that. Like, you should have been more curious as to who I was. Yeah, yeah. No, you, you've judged me on the 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 setting. Right. And you, you've pegged me as a loser. And you've just immediately made that judgment. Instead of being curious of who, I'm, who I am and uh, what I'm capable of, that you've already made a judgment on me. Right. And that's such a beautiful thing. And, like... Yeah, and, and you know, I think, like, that's, to me... That is the the moral underpinnings of the show that make it really good and better than like a normal a normal sitcom, right? Because it's not just funny, it's right. not just you know acerbic in certain ways. It is like there's this moral kind of lesson that you're learning along with these characters that I find just that that's what makes it good. Yeah, and if that's if and, and that's like the takeaway yep. of man, if the world could take away judgment, right, and just be more curious, try to try to understand more, right. Instead of making judgments and that being the the end end all be all yep. to any given situation, of like, man, you did a shitty thing right there. I hate you for that. Yeah. Well, why did you do the shitty thing? Let's try to understand that. Oh, there might be a solution there, or at least now I have the understanding of what made you do that. So now I can maybe adjust the way that I treat you or act to you instead of it just being we're yeah, done. Exactly. You know. Exactly. Beautiful, beautiful little sentiment. I agree. Well, on that note, do you have anything else? Back to the whiskey. Sure. I, I think this is a quintessential, and I, and I was saving it, hoping that it would be. Yeah. Just from what I had like heard of other people's takes on it. Uh huh. I think this is a, a perfect like holiday whiskey. I agree. Like that. Completely. That, that sweetness on the sherry. Yep. 
it's very, you know, just, it makes you think like red berries and holidays. It really and, like, does. It, it, it fits the bill. And this would be great around the fire. This would be great around, you know, dinner table, just kind of hanging out. Yep. Talking with friends. Absolutely. Yeah. And what, what I find interesting about that is that it's such a high proof and yet it checks all of those boxes. Cause like yeah. sometimes like you get a high proof and like, Nope, it's challenging. I don't, I, I think that it can be challenging for some people, mm-hmm. but I think like if you are somebody who um, is interested in whiskey, like this is a great high proof entry bottle. Yeah. I quite like it. And yeah, this is a good find. Yep. I'm gonna be a little sad when that bottle goes. Yeah, it probably won't. It, uh, it's gonna go quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, we want to know what you think about the Abalor Ab- Abanada Abanad Abanad Abanad. Uh, we also want to know what do you think about Ted Lasso? Yeah, who's your favorite character? Uh, and why is it Coach Beard? <laughs> <laughs> no, who is your favorite character? And honestly, like, I want to know what character do you like to hate. I think that there's some interesting characters in here. Characters with redemptive arcs that like you might still not like. Yeah. I, I've genuinely kind of grown to enjoy Jamie Tart. <laughs> Jamie Tart. Jamie. Or for Kent. He's here. He's there. He's every fucking every fucking way. <laughs> so good. Roy Kent. <laughs> uh well, you can get in touch with us through email. It's dreppingstone at gmail.com. You can also get in touch with us through social media. It's always one word, dreppingstone. Come find us, like us, share a thing, like a thing, laugh at a thing. A lot of good things. Also, you can support the podcast through our Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash dreppingstone. Indeed. We got a lot of good things going on there, Kyle, especially as we're getting, you know, building that community a little bit more, adding new stuff. Trying new week. things. Yeah. Yeah. It's always there first. Absolutely. Most things. Most things. <laughs> Most things. You can also support the podcast by rating Drip and Stone wherever it is you find great podcasts like this one. And finally, you can support the podcast as you go out shopping for your holiday wares. Just tell someone. Tell someone about Drip and Stone. Absolutely. Like, hey. Share the good word. Yeah. Hey. You're share. buying that Christmas ornament? Yeah. I know the gift that you've got for that person you think is the right gift, but hey, give them the gift of entertainment and let them know about Drip and Stone. <laughs> Correct. Mm. <laughs> that's it. it i got i got i got nothing else that, that is the definitive cannot way not beat it nope the you gift cannot that keeps on giving hey buddy hey buddy <laughs> may your glass overflow just like a jelly of the month club and your ass never show <laughs> cheers buddy cheers Hi there. Hey. What you doing? Um, That's not a thing we've ever done. It got emotional rather quickly. (laughs) It made it better? (laughs) It made it a lot better. Oh, okay. Just... (laughs) (laughs) That's a nice map. Maybe it's done in Kruger. I think I could. Like I'm, I'm, I'm confident. I know I couldn't. I know I couldn't. That's what I'm saying, though. I want to, I want to like final thoughts on the bottle. Nope. Just kidding. I'll do that at the end. Okay. I'm glad we can share this, by the way. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> I feel like a new man. Like that was amazing. But I would even say, like in England, like to call <laughs> but someone with Twitter the way it is nowadays, we can say what we want. That's good. You did the thing. Thank you, kid. I can die now. <laughs> Please don't. I've done my part. <laughs> That's the gift that keeps on giving, Clark.